I could tell you about my customers in my sleep. Like I know their problems. I know exactly their struggles, like to down to the words they would use because I've just been living in that for so many years. So it's like building that first and then designing something that they might want. The draw for membership for me personally was that it felt like it was much easier to scale in terms of reach and how you deliver those benefits to your members. You know, in, in my case and in a lot of memberships cases is, you know, it's the same amount of effort for one member that it is a thousand members. Welcome to Creative Independence, a podcast by Memberful. I'm Jen Matichuk. And I'm Cy Wilmore. In this podcast, we speak to successful and passionate entrepreneurs who have won big in the creator economy. We believe that what's interesting to you is interesting to others. Passion pays. Don't be afraid to pursue and do what you love. The passion is palpable. Talia Corin is the founder and CEO of Workweek Lunch, a meal preparation blog and subscription service. She's been featured in publications including the New York Times and Women's Health and is the author of the Workweek Lunch Cookbook. Thank you so much for joining us today, Talia. I hope you're keeping well. I'm great. Thanks for having me on. I'm super excited to get into it. Before starting Workweek Lunch, Talia knew she loved creating content. So she found a niche she was familiar with, saw a gap in it, and dove in head first. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about you guys, how you eat during your work day, but Back in the office of 2015, I was like the quote unquote healthy girl, like bringing in my lunches. And at first people made fun of me. They're like, ha like what's like, oh, look at you with your, you're so healthy, whatever. And I'm not, I'm like, okay, whatever. <laughs> and uh, they, they would all like, go out to get Chipotle and I was trying to save money just to travel and stuff. And then eventually they started pulling me aside. Like, okay, how do you do this though? And I'm like, what do you mean? You just roast some vegetables and put it in a container. And they're like, um, no, but like, how do you actually do this so consistently? So I kind of got the sense that there were like my peers, like other mid twenties people were struggling with this. Like they knew that spending money on lunch at, in New York city, like in Manhattan every day was not ideal for their health and also for their wallet and just like whatever. And, uh, that's kind of how I knew like, okay, there's something here. Obviously meal prep was a thing though. People were already doing it. And a lot of my friends were like, Talia, why would you start a food blog in 2016? I'm like, well, I don't know. Like, there's a gap here. You know, there's something missing. I actually took a course about how to build an online business because, like, I was what, 24. I really wanted to like side hustle. That was like the side hustle time. It still is kind of, but it was like just starting. And I was like, okay, I'm going to build a blog. I'm going to, you know, figure that out. So I found this course that is now called Earnable. Um, it's by Ramit Sethi, who's an author. And I just signed up and I was like, okay, I'm, I put in my like two grand and I was just determined to earn that back. <laughs> like if I could earn, yeah, it's like if I could just build something and earn it back, I will be happy. Of course, I've earned that many times over and it was like a great investment. But um, that's kind of how, like I didn't just throw stuff online and it worked. I did follow a system. And I think that you don't have, like, there's no like perfect course or best course, just like finding someone who's done it before who can teach you how to do it and following the steps. is like pretty straightforward. And I think that people get really in their heads about it and trying to be perfect and trying to be like really big before they're not or acting, you know, they want to present themselves like all polished, but you can't go into starting something new and expect it to be polished. You just have to go. And I had that attitude. I think it helps. Naturally, most people have, have many passions and very varied passions. But interestingly, Workweek Lunch started as a passion project as well. Um, but was there a moment or an event that made you realize you could turn this passion project into a professional pursuit? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, I want to say that cooking is not my passion. It, it's like, I it's a creative outlet for me that I got good at with the practice, right? I started working lunch when I was still kind of bad at cooking. Because the, there's this idea that a fourth grader, a fourth grader can t teach a second grader. You know what I mean? Like, like a, yeah. So that was kind of how, like, I learned how to cook while building this business. It was just really weird. But I would say my, my real, <laughs> I really love creating content. That's my real passion. So that could be about really anything. Before I even thought of meal prep, I did, I did look at snowboarding, starting a snowboarding blog, decided there wasn't enough, there wouldn't have been enough money in it, really. And the second thing, the second thing I was looking at was solo, uh, female solo travel, which is a really big passion of mine. And I almost wrote, like, I almost started something around that. And then when I joined that course I mentioned earlier, 
this was the first topic that I decided to explore. It just happened to work because again, with food, there's already a huge demand. Everyone eats. I mean, you know, like, yeah. So it, I got lucky. I think I got really lucky with that. Like it was just the first, my first sw- real swing just happened to be the thing. But yeah, I mean, I don't see myself cooking. Like I don't even even really cook for the business anymore. That's the crazy thing. My team does it. I don't really even touch recipes that much. So like right now I'm even starting other things on the side. Like I have been, I, I'm starting a podcast on the side right now that's about dating. So like, just because why not? You know, it's like, I want to pursue other passions and see what I could do with them. What you love doesn't always translate to a thriving business. However, when you are passionate about what you're building and how you're building it, that passion exudes from your work. So your audience sees it and feels it. Trying new things is the best way to learn and to build that passion. The great thing about starting is no one's looking at you yet. So it really doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter if it's like you have typos or if you say something that doesn't quite resonate, it's fine. And I think going into every day being like, what are the conversations I can start? What are people, what are people talking about? What do they care about? So in the beginning to generate those ideas, I would go to Reddit and I would go to Amazon and look at reviews of like cookbooks in my space. I would look at products like, what are people what are people missing? What are they complaining about? What are their problems? So I think digging online to find the commentary on the pain point you're addressing from real people, don't just imagine it. Don't just guess. Like go find the real people. Reddit's a great place. Like people love to complain on Reddit. And so, you know, they're going to talk, <laughs> they'll go in deep on their problems. It's like all anonymous. So I use that to generate those early ideas before I had an audience, before I had that community. Taking more swings has been my intention for 2022. Like, it's just, I am constantly pushing myself out of my comfort zone. I'm sure a lot of creators and business owners can relate. Like, to get to where you want to be next, you have to do things that you've never done before. You know, that's like the saying. And in terms of motivating myself to do things that are scary, I use fear as a signal. It's like, if I'm scared of it, if there's a resistance, I pr- that probably means I should do it. It probably means it's going to make an impact it, and that it's scary because I've never done it. I've got to try it. So it's like you can flip it to a positive. And then, of course, like releasing expectations of, of the outcome. You know, if you go into things, trying new things, and you're like, let's just see what happens versus I have to succeed. Like, oh no, if I fail, like, like lower the stakes, lower the expectations, just see what happens. You know, my mom, who is also an entrepreneur, she's always like, there are no failures, they're just lessons, you know, to just move on. That's good. It's a good way to look at it. Um, so obviously, uh, when you're hiring out this team and you're expanding your business, other pieces of your business have expand have have to expand with it. And at some point you decided that membership made the most sense um closer to the beginning. Why did you choose membership as a way to monetize and what has it meant for you and your business as you move forward? Yeah, I tried a couple other business models or just different ways to provide value to my community. Um, and I, again, membership was a swing. It was a chance. I was like, let's just try this. And again, my mom, she swooped and she was like, listen, you got to try this. Just Put put a paywall on your content and charge people for it. You know, <laughs> just see what happens. And in the food blogging world, like recipes are free. There are millions of free recipes. So it's like I had all these internal scripts of like, oh God, who would pay for recipes online? But thousands and thousands of people do, you know, and that's so that was a great thing. And what it meant, I mean, within three months of launching my membership, after already having a following, I was able to go full time within three months. And now you know, I have a team. So like that, yeah, so it's meant a lot. Although today Talia has a strong community, initially there was no guarantee that her idea would perform or be successful. Yet, little by little, she kept her community thriving and engaged, ensuring her business stays relevant and approachable. Yeah, I, that, I love those questions. I never really thought about it before. And I think, I don't think it's changed. I think that the community numbers, both social and the membership are the main metrics I look at because if you have like a successful business to have that is to solve problems. Like you have to be solving someone's problems. So the more people we have in the community, the more people I know we're helping. And that is 
why I think I care so much about those numbers, like how big is our community, how many people are re reaching and how many people are in our membership, because I know we're solving major problems for them. You know, some folks uh, probably need to hear that. They need to understand that they need to build something that solves those problems. Um, so for anyone looking to maybe emulate the success and start a membership business that you've seen, what would you say is your main piece of advice? My main piece of advice would be to grow the community first before you even know what you're going to sell um, and really figure out what their pain points are. Learn, like I could tell you about my customers in my sleep. Like I know their problems. I know exactly their struggles, like to down to the words they would use because I've just been living in that for so many years. So it's like building that first and then designing something that they might want, you know, that is, the, I think a lot of people do it the other way around, right? Build it and then they will come. No, they, no, that's not a guarantee. Build the community first and then figure out what they want. Talia built her community by expanding on one of her passions. She didn't expect it to grow to where it is today, but it happened. And many are grateful she pursued her idea of work week lunch. Our next guest, Michael, followed a similar path. Photography started as a hobby and quickly grew into a passion. He now helps others expand their creativity through photography. Today, we're joined by Michael Gillespie, founder of Found Wild Project and current customer success specialist at Memberful. Hi, Michael. How are you doing today? You well? Hey, guys. Glad to be here. Hope you're doing well, too. Michael's interest in photography stemmed from always walking around with a camera. He loved documenting and telling stories through an image, which brought him to his first photography job and then eventually to creating Found Wild Project. Early on, you know, it, I was just, I was out on the weekends, everywhere I went, I had a camera and it was, it didn't matter if it was, you know, in the mountains, downtown, you know, I had the, I had a camera with me and early on that interest kind of grew into something like, wow, I really would like to tell other people's story. And slowly over time, more and more contacts were made. And I actually got my first gig as someone actually offered to pay me to shoot a wedding. And I was so excited and, you know, nervous, like never done this before. I, I was the only one, like most, most wedding photographers have like a team of people. Right. And I'm here, I am solo and just kind of thrown in the fire kind of thing. So, so a uh, long story short, uh, everything went great. It, it, you know, it ended in a way that just made me think like, wow, once that was over and looking back at everything that the story as everything unfolded, um, the, the look on the client's face when you show them that photo for the first time, it's like, wow, it's like they're reliving that moment through someone else's eyes. And that that kind of like really resonated with me. And, you know, that turned into another job and then, you know, word spread. And then that kind of became like an ongoing thing for me. Like every weekend I had some form of gig I was working on. Uh, and, and that probably lasted for five to six years before I kind of took a step back and say, hey, what else can I do here? What other impact could I have outside of just doing small, you know, one time gigs here and there? If you look around, obviously there's content everywhere. It's, you know, we're oversaturated in the content space. Photography itself is very subjective and um, it's, you know, you need to stand out. You need to have something that sets you apart from the rest of the folks. How do you say that Found Wild Project as a whole does this and how do you stand out? When Found Wild Project was started, it was started in a moment where there was this perception that existed that says, unless you have hundreds of thousands or millions of followers as a photographer, you probably aren't being seen and you probably don't have a future in this passion of yours. Found Wild was an attempt to reframe that thinking. And I always, I always, always said to myself that Found Wild Project would be something for the rest of us. And what I, what I mean by that was that for all of the people who had an aspiration to be a photographer or to create something and how to turn that into a long-term pursuit, Found Wild Project was, was meant to be the narrative and the inspiration and the how-to to carve that path out as you travel down that road. So that was kind of the, the backstory for how Found Wild Project came to be. 
And in terms of, you know, how you tell someone or how you help someone to stand out in what feels like a sea of creative artists, it really gets back to just owning your lane of work. What do you do? And focusing on what you do, not what someone else does, but the work that you do. And when you learn your work and you stick to your work and you pursue your work in a way that's authentic and consistent, I think I think I think that has a way of ultimately becoming rewarded. And part of that reward is that other people start to notice other people start to see just how authentic you are. Uh, so so I think I think the takeaway there is that know what you're good at and develop it in a way that you can be the best at it. Because Michael wanted to reframe the thinking of photography and being creative online, he was able to move from being a photographer to helping others frame their own work in an authentic way. His passion shines through in his membership. Three years ago, no one would have thought this moment would, have, would have ultimately have come to exist. And the pivot from a photography driven space on Instagram to video has really you know, for a lot of people, it's, it's been a headache. It's been a headache for, for, for still photography creators. It's been a headache for anyone who depended on that avenue to generate buzz about their business or to share what it is they're making with the world. And ultimately, I think what we're going to, we're going to get to an, to another moment where there, there's going to be a bridge to cross and the bridge probably looks something like, you know, if you if 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 we if we choose to continue to be a part of a of a platform where work of any kind can be shared, um, I think that I need I think the thing that's you got to be careful with is that Instagram may end up in a moment where you know there's backlash among photographers. They need somewhere to be. They need somewhere to share things, and it's hard to imagine a world where that group of people is no longer the bread and butter of Instagram, but we're slowly getting there now. So when you look at what you do, like, how do you grow? How do you get the word out about what you're doing? I think, I think in general, there's lots of opportunities that are starting to like pop up outside of Instagram. And whether that's micro communities that are only, only focused on photography, whether that's some sort of network um, that you can plug yourself into where that group of people is there for one reason and one reason only, um, those kind of things seem to be gaining traction. And I talk to a lot of people where, you know, three years ago, everything they did was on Instagram. And now there's this sudden need and realization that you it's in your best interest to diversify away from Instagram, not leave Instagram, but Instagram needs to be a part of what you're doing. But Instagram doesn't need to be the sole focus of everything you're doing. And for the members that I've talked to, the folks who have stuck with Instagram, but also kind of explored the other avenues about where things are where things are happening in terms of photography it's only been beneficial to whatever it is they're doing and i think the more breadcrumbs you can leave across you know the space the better but it's just it's so much more challenging today to to establish yourself and be seen on an instagram only world so to speak Let's dive a little bit more into the member feedback, if you would, Michael. I've got two kind of sub questions. One, hopefully nice and simple, purely logistical for people listening in who are interested to build memberships of their own. And maybe one question which is a bit more kind of ethereal or a bit more all encompassing. So question one, member feedback, obviously crucial within a membership, but arguably for any company, feedback of a customer is fantastic. So how do you do that? Is it email? Is it social media? Question two, can you kind of elaborate on some of your favorite interactions or some of the most beneficial interactions over the years of found well project? Sure. So most of the member feedback in my case happens over email. Um, I get, I get two to three emails a week. Sometimes I'll get 10 emails a week that is either commenting on something that we've just recently put out questions about if we could introduce this type of benefit in the future, I'm looking for this, would love to have this in the membership. Um, I have, I've had so many great conversations with people, um, that it would actually just, it would blow your, it blows your mind when you think about when you get to see what you're doing and how that trickles into the life of someone else and how it's put into practice, it kind of changes your perspective a little bit because then you want to work for those members and do everything you can to make sure that they're happy. Uh, I, I'll never forget. I got an email from a member that 
that that recently had had an opportunity to shoot for a basically do a photo shoot for a, for a large brand that they had been a fan of forever and the the specific comment was that had it not been for the membership and had it not been for the tools that I had access to I likely would have never been able to pursue this thing and much less have this opportunity. And, and, and I keep that, I took a screenshot of that email and I always just save it on my desktop because I, I like to read it and see it, you know, as much as possible. It kind of keeps you, keeps you focused. But the, on the other side of your question about, you know, if I, if you just look back at, all of the feedback that I've gotten over the years, there's there's one more that sticks out to me is that I got an email from it was it was a basically there the, the, this guy had been in the in the membership for about two years and he said, hey, you know, I'm a National Ge Geographic photographer and it turns out oh, he's an award winning National Geographic photographer. And he said, just want to say I love what you do. Enjoy the content that you put out. Uh, just keep up the great work. And I remember that I was like, wow, like I had a moment like you never because you never really know who the people are that are in your membership until you hear from them. And, uh, you know, those two moments really stand out to me uh, in terms of the interactions I've had with members and and kind of the thing that keeps motivating me to keep going and to keep to keep giving folks different things to act off of. So I think that goes a long way. When you're first starting your business, it can be hard to place a monetary value on what you're doing. If you speak to your audience and find out how you're providing value, you'll be better able to price and share your work accordingly. Don't be afraid to price your passion. If you look, if you look at the concept of value, you know, what are you, what are you producing? What are you offering in exchange for payment? Uh, you know, a lot of people make a mistake of taking something that's been free for years and and suddenly throwing a paywall up in front of it and expecting people to pay you know that that can work in some instances but i think if you look at the underlying re relationship between the creator and their audience there's a line of trust that's very defined there and it, and it's a, and it's a, you got to strike a balance between trust and intent and I think overall, when like in my case, I knew that the product was so valuable, not only in terms of what it offered, but the financial value of it was just so far removed from what existed in the marketplace that I was not afraid to to say, hey, here's this new product. We're going to charge X amount of dollars for it. And I think early on, it was evident that people saw the value there and, and they gladly jumped in and supported and, and came on as members. Uh, for other people who were going down that journey, not knowing like, how do I how do I get from free to paid or how do I start asking people to pay for something that's just been there forever? You, you've got you've got to you have to be honest. And the honesty part of this gets about when you when you show your true intent behind what it is you're doing and you communicate to your following that, hey, this is an endeavor. And I think it provides value because of these reasons. And when someone understands why you're doing what you're doing and realize that that's your livelihood, I think it's easier to get folks more excited about supporting you on a recurring basis than it is to just say, throw up a throw up a website and say, hey, be my fan and pay me X amount of dollars a month. So it's authentic, it's authenticity, it's intent, and it's just that relationship between you and your members. Instagram is wonderful, but it's only really a one way conversation. I know you can comment on people's uh, photos, videos, reels, etc., but it feels really like it's a one way avenue of conversation. Membership is slightly different in that it brings everybody together. Is that why you chose membership? There's Lord knows there are plenty of ways to monetize digital media or digital publications, whatever you like to call them. But what was it specifically about membership that felt right for Found Wild Project? So membership for Found Wild Project was almost a natural fit because the audience, the, the creative individuals, the photographers of the world, the aspiring photographers of the world, if you just go look at the pain points that these people face in their journey of trying to make it as a photographer or as a creative artist, these people end up spending a lot of money on a lot of different things to refine and establish their style. 
Um, so one of the value propositions for Found Wealth Project was that you can become a member and, you know, for a small monthly fee, you get you get an instant access to like two or three thousand dollars worth of photography related editing tools. You get access to commentary that speaks and removes all the noise about what's going on in the space, what's going on in the market. And the draw for membership for me personally was that it felt like it was much easier to scale in terms of reach and how you deliver those benefits to your members. You know, in, in my case and in a lot of memberships cases is, you know, it's the same amount of effort for one member that it is a thousand members. And when you have a product that you can deliver to that many people, um, I think it makes sense on a in terms of efficiency, just pure efficiency. How easy is it to put this product into this many people's hands on an ongoing basis? And it, that was part of it. And the second part of it was just the market fit between what the product was, is that you go look at this group of people. They're spending a lot of money on lots of new things, and there's always a new product out. There's always a new set of editing tools out. And, and folks just seem to pick and chase at things. And Found Wild Project was kind of just meant to be a place you can come to, you step inside, and that you get all of these things delivered regularly as a benefit. And it was just a natural fit. Michael, let's say, as we kind of wend our way slowly towards the end of this conversation, something that I think a lot of people will be really excited to hear is if you have any advice for people who are interested in either starting a membership or maybe following on a passion project, uh, you know, or the, the kind of the intersection of both of those things. Maybe they feel there's the, the start of something here. They've got a, a, a growing community, but they haven't necessarily monetized it or they haven't necessarily formalized it. For this kind of people, what kind of tips, what kind of advice would you give them? The first thing would be to, to, to stop thinking about it and do it and start, right? Um, you'd be shocked at the number of people who sit on a great idea for years before they even, you know, try to develop it or if they develop it at all. Um, you know, I've seen it. I've seen the, I've seen this game with lots of other people play out where folks had this idea in the back of their mind and they just didn't believe quite enough in their self that they could do it. And I always tell people that you have to be willing to take a chance on yourself because if, because if you don't, who will, right? And you know, you got to also be willing to fail. You will fail. You will, you will fall off that ride. You're going to get bruised up a good bit, but that's part of the game and that's how you grow. Um, I can remember that, you know, there's a lot of there's no perfect handbook to, to starting and, and, and finding wild success. There's just there's just not. And it looks different for everybody. But the number one thing is that you just have to be willing to start. And if you get started, all of those questions that are in the back of your mind, they're going to get answered. And it may not be in the ideal way that you want them answered, but they're going to get answered. Uh, so you stop thinking about it and just dive in. Passion was the spark that led both Talia and Michael to create thriving businesses because it was evident that they loved what they were doing and they were able to build a group of similarly passionate people around them. Passion breeds following. We believe that what's interesting to you is interesting to others. Passion pays. Don't be afraid to pursue and do what you love. The passion is palpable. I'm Sai. And I'm Jen. And this is Creative Independence, a podcast by Memberful. Thank you to Talia Corrin and Michael Gillespie for joining us today. You can find Michael at www.foundwildproject.com. You can find Talia at workweeklunch.com. Thank you for listening. Be sure to leave us a review. We'll catch you next time. 